for anthroposophy, but I really hadn't found it. Now, along the way, I got dragged to a nutrition conference in Spring Valley, New York, and while I was there, I met John Davey. And John was the science editor previously to his work at Emerson College, uh, the science editor for The Observer. Very strong scientist, but also an anthroposophist. And it was through John that I ended up going to Emerson College. Within a month of being there, I got a call from IBM where I had been work where I was working and I had taken a sabbatical. And they said, you gotta come back. Your replacement accidentally deleted your simulation model, and so all of our development's on hold. And I said, but I can't. I'm, you know, I've spent all this money to be over here at Emerson College, and they go, well, you really have to. Don't, don't leave us in the lurch like this. So I flew back. And I was gone for a month to put this all back in place. And so all the students that I'd gotten to know now knew that I worked in the computer field. And when I got back, they were sort of coming up to me and going, why are you working for the enemy? <laughs> and I was quite taken by this. And I remember Francis Edmonds putting his arm around me and saying, just become a Walter teacher. Become a Walter teacher. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's, that's not a bad idea. And then John Davey, took me, John Davey took me aside and he said, you know, we can't leave any field to Aramon. Now, some of you don't know what I'm talking about, perhaps, and I will try to explain that as we go through. But uh, just for the story's sake, bear with me. He said, if we leave anything to these forces of darkness, they will be much stronger than if anthroposophy and spiritual science can penetrate all the fields that humanity is involved in. This became a theme for me, and I spent 42 years in the computer industry. And during that period of time, I found the fear of technology and the awareness of its dehumanizing capabilities was growing and growing amongst anthroposophists. And I found more and more were starting to take what I will call the Essene approach to back away from it. And I thought, this is not right. And so I began my deep study to find out what did Rudolf Steiner have to say about technology? What did Rudolf Steiner have to say about the sciences? Now, my father is an astronomer. He's now retired, like I am as well. Um, he's 94. He published papers for over 50 years and won some award. And um, when I was growing up, we went to a congregational church every Sunday. His father was a minister. My ancestors came over on the Mayflower. <laughs> um, <laughs> and. Um, <clears throat> So over the years, I know his religious inclinations have altered. And in a recent visit, he lives in Seattle, I asked him, you know, where are your beliefs today? And he started out saying, well, I believe in the periodic table. And then he stopped and he goes, I don't want to discuss this. So he's very much a scientist. Now, You'll see, if you can stick all the way through to lecture three, Saturday morning. Um, and by the way, um, oops, where's my, okay, I'll come to it. Um, I'll come to what the schedule is, but I just want to do an introduction. Tonight, we're going to try to look at this theme from as deep and far-reaching a cosmic perspective as we can. Now, I know some of you are new to anthroposophy. There is a book that I will be leaning on that Rudolf Steiner wrote early in his years 
um, which normally was called an outline of occult science. It's now published under the name an outline of esoteric science. And I will go into what these mean in, in a little later. On tomorrow night's lecture, which will flow from tonight, but you don't need to be here tonight to hear tomorrow's, we will take a much more just earth and not a much deeper perspective. And how does technology fit into evolution and devolution? And then in the workshops, we will be looking at really modern times and really focusing on that. And we will be asking questions about electricity and evil. We will look at artificial intelligence and artificial souls. And I will try to bring a wrap to all of this. I'm telling you that this is quite an adventure. I hope that all of you can get through all of these. Um, if you can't, I have posted all of these on my website, and they're available now. You can pull down all these lectures for free. They're as PDFs. If you go there, you can navigate to lectures, to the lecture archive, and they're all available as PDFs. So here's the schedule we're going to go through tonight. We're looking at the path to Jupiter, the merging of man and machines. Tomorrow night, we will start looking at preparations for post-Atlantean ages. What do I mean by that? Well, for those, um, you, I'm sure everyone in this room has heard of Atlantis and the cultural ages since the time of Atlantis, uh, each run about 2,160 years of the time it takes for the precession of the equinoxes to move through one of the zodiac signs. This question of sexuality with technology is all part of this post-Atlantean age. And so uh, we will be taking a look very deeply at what that all has to mean and why it is something that we have to deal with. So in the workshops, I will carry that into the first talk on Saturday. Um, and if you're not familiar with the concept of sex bots, I will give you just a brief introduction to that. We'll talk about the god of technology, Hephaestus, and go into some of the mythology that pertains to today. And then we're going to do some eurythmy to experience what rhythms are. And Gabrielle Schneider is here with us. And she will be uh, working with you and me on this. And um, we'll be looking at eurythmy in a way that will give us the experience necessary that out of that experience, we can then creatively enter into what is electricity? What is resonance? What are Keeley machines and the Strotter machines from the mystery plays? And we'll be examining all of those at that time. And then we will do some further eurythmy exercises, and then we will close with this session on artificial intelligence, artificial souls, and the role of the consciousness soul in our age towards the development of our role as co-creators for Jupiter. Any questions on this? It's an, it's an immense undertaking. And I'm, I'm deeply afraid of overwhelming people. Um, these will not all be lectures, but I have lecture material for all of these. So we will see how much the need for questions are, and I can always turn this off or turn it on as needed. Okay? One other point, I'm using PowerPoint slides and I'm using technology here on purpose. Many people have asked me, why don't you just speak? And I can. I can do all of these talks without the PowerPoint, without the laptop. But I am choosing to use them on purpose because this is a talk on technology. And many of you have experienced lectures without the technology. Now you will be able to use them in comparison. 
I would say if you're part of the 10 to 20% that it's going to fall asleep, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Uh, that's what happens. I'm lucky that this little tiny projector here has no noise that you can hear. Most projectors uh, 10 years ago would make enough white noise that 20% of you would fall asleep. Um, so, as I say, it's on purpose I'm using this technology. Uh, I want you to try to experience it. And I will say right off the bat that technology is a double-edged sword. And it's, if you look at Revelations and all, that the uh, tongue of this being has a double-edged sword. It is what we have to face. There is no avoiding this. So, tonight, merging with machines, and let's just dive in, as Steiner would say, plunge right in. Now, last week, a group called Moral Technologies, nothing to do with Anthrotech, although I think they might have been inspired by them, in Australia, invited Nikonar Perlos. Oh, yeah. He was there for a week. I'm glad you know. It's on Some YouTube. You know. It's on YouTube. And it's all up on YouTube now, so you can watch his presentations. There's, I was surprised. We do have quite a bit of overlap, but maybe only about 15 to 20 percent. So um, there's a lot to be gained by looking at these YouTube videos. When you pull down the PDFs, you can click on this or click on Facebook to get the Moral Technologies, where you can also get to Nick and Orr's presentations. Mm -hmm. Amazing okay. individual. As a scientist, he's top notch. He knows his science. And he can bring the scientific perspective and merit with the anthroposophy like few can. Incredible person. I wish I was there. So Waldorf schools, as we know, especially the K through 8, if you go to Silicon Valley, the top executives of the high-flying, high-tech companies send their kids to the Waldorf schools. They're springing up all over California because of the BD uh, wine growers <laughs> and, and the need for, uh, in Silicon Valley for Waldorf schools. It's interesting. They don't want their kids, even though they are selling technology to children, they want their own kids to go to Walter schools because they don't have the technology there. That's fascinating, isn't it? Here's one, the forest kindergarten, where uh, three hours a day, children spend three to six hours outdoors. It's interesting. There's a Facebook, YouTube video right now about um, Finland and their schools. And Finland has the highest ranking graduates of high school in the world. And yet they spend only, in the first three grades, only 20 hours a week in school. And most of that time is spent playing. That's a good idea. <laughs> yes. That's a good idea. So all of this says, we want no TV, we want no adult technology for our kids. Why? Well, children need to recapitulate history. There was technology in history. There were catapults and chariots. And so it's very good when they get to the fifth grade to be getting out the swords and, and riding on horses and so on. That's wonderful for them. But when is it OK to bring in technology? And I would say. In the eighth grade, you can. And this may change in the coming years because the children are changing and their capability is changing. But for today, let's say it's around grade eight that they need to be introduced to the world. But what about anthroposophists? Because of the Waldorf schools, many anthroposophists, oh, and by the way, one of the talks I did without that was to a Camp Hill group. So I didn't use any technology there for their request. But, so I think many anthroposophists 
take the Waldorf model and they do this to technology. No, no. So is it dehumanizing? There are anthroposophists that look at some of what Steiner wrote, and we will take a look at that on Saturday, about electricity and evil. I will give you a preview today. He does not equate those two, but he says that electricity, in the way we conceive it, this is fascinating, folks, the way we conceive of electricity, our model of the atom, renders it to be a carrier of evil. Electricity is not evil, but it is rendered by our conception of it into not evil, but a carrier of evil. And it brings to mind Lucifer. What is Lucifer? What does that name mean? It means the carrier or the bearer of the light. So should we avoid the use of technology? Mm -hmm. Depends maybe on the age. Steer our kids away from careers in technology? This is absolutely no. But we will take a look why. I want to, by the way, I don't want to give you set answers. I'm going to try to present things to you, but I'm going to try to leave you as free as much as I can to make your own decisions about some of this. So, well, now, Rudolf Steiner talks about in the end of these post-Atlantean times, just as Atlantis had a horrible tragedy in which it was all flooded, so it had a tragedy based on water, and Lemuria before that had a tragedy based on fire or volcanic eruptions, um, that this post-Atlantean period or epics, epic will end by humanity self-destroying itself. And he calls it a war of all against all, where egoism will be reigning so powerfully in different ways. And technology, one can say, maybe is bringing this war of all against all too soon. So another quote from Riddle Steiner, it is an indispensable condition of initiation that we should not wish things were otherwise. So with that, I want to ask you now, what is your picture of the future? So take a moment, get a nice big picture in your mind. What will this future look like? And now, think of another picture. What would you like that picture of the future to be? Not what do you think it will be, but what picture would please you so that when you reincarnate again, what will you be coming back to that will please you, so make you want to come to Earth again? Well, some of you pictured something like this. <laughs> And some of you pictured something like this. <laughs> if you went this way, you have luciferic tendencies. If you went this way, you have aromatic tendencies. And we'll explain lucifer and aromon a little bit for those who don't. Now some of you may have said, let's go back to the Stone Age. And some of you may be looking at Earth that looks like this, and here's our vehicle for getting around on it. Steiner said there's no going back. And it's very important, what he says about this, is it has to do largely with rhythm. So Gabriella will show us all about rhythms Saturday. Um, but we had to get away from the given rhythms that the gods gave us. And this goes even further. It says that there are people in Riddle Steiner's time that wanted the back to nature movement. And he calls them amateurs. This eating only fruits that are available at that time. 
Um, it's fascinating because I was one of those. And to read Steiner on this, I was very, very shocked by this. But he talks about needing to, to find our own set of rhythms. We have to become independent of those old rhythms. And if you think back, yeah, women used to all have 28-day menstruation cycles, and they would all have their uh, time of highest fertility at the same week or so. And um, <clears throat> well, anyway, there's lots of other sort of cycles. But he says, in becoming independent, we can't lose our feet. We can't just get rid of all cycles. And so there's importance in building our own inner cycles. And we'll talk a lot more about that on Saturday. Um, man should not believe that he can live without rhythm. I, by the way, in all of these, I've tried to put where the material is. In many cases, these are direct quotes. In some cases, in order to fit them on the page, I've had to <coughs> reduce them a little bit. But by and large, I haven't changed the meaning or anything in any of these. So I mentioned my father is an astronomer. And it's interesting, you can look up metallicity. Um, there's a web page on it in Wikipedia. The question was, if we take this nebula that we were all taught in high school physics or even college physics or astrophysics, and everything starts with this nebula, and the nebula somehow starts spinning, and so where the direction it spins creates a disk, and on the disk you get things that form, and you'll get a sun, and that kind of stuff. But all the materials are going to be just hydrogen and helium. How from the Big Bang did we get to anything that was bigger, molecular speaking, or atomistically speaking, than hydrogen and helium? So that's where this whole idea of metallicity comes in. So after the first solar system, we had a Big Bang. And during the Big Bang, we started getting elements fused together so that we got carbon and aluminum. And this process went on until we got the bigger metals and then finally really heavy metals. So in the 13 to 14 billion years, we've had two or three previous solar systems, according to physics. Wow, this really lines up with what Steiner had to say. Pretty impressive, I think. He talks about the first one of these being old Saturn. And you notice the days of the week, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and Earth is Tuesday and Wednesday. The first part is Mars and the second part is Mercury. We'll go more into that. But on, here we are, back here, what we call our angels, we're at the human stage. If we go farther back, the archangels were at the human stage, and before that, the archai were at the human stage. And we were through all of this, but nothing like what we are, because now we're at the human stage. We had no physical bodies. In fact, there were no physical bodies. When I say physical here, all there was was warmth. And then, as an element, fire emerges from this, but there's nothing physical. So how can you perceive of warmth without molecules? So I'll leave that as a question. We won't try to answer that tonight. But if you try to imagine what um, these etheric forces are, there's nothing physical about them. And so one could, if you can perceive the etheric realm, you would experience different degrees of warmth, you know, warmth bodies. And as these warmth bodies then re-arise in old sun, they can start taking on etheric as the etheric is built. And then when we um, uh, move on to old moon, something else is added. And each time we added something, a new etheric Quality, um, essence is added, so we go from warmth to light to tone to the life ether. So we have the four ethers, 
and the four elements that arise simultaneously with each one of these new planetary conditions. So another way to look at this, in the beginning was the word, we start with a kind of motion. Okay. And so in old Saturn, we have an ether, warm, we have fire as the element, and we have something that balances that warmth ether. A fallen ether is one word that's used. I don't like this word fallen, but I'm going to use it. What was the word, Grant, you had tonight? Uh, when Held back. Held back. Held back, yes. I like that much better. So when we get to Old Sun, you can see this development, that can, and it continues on out. Um, this direction tries to unify, but through amalgamation, whereas this direction opposes that, it tries to keep things separate, pull things apart. This is, shall we say, basic anthroposophy, um, occult science, uh, or that esoteric science goes into this quite deeply. Why are we doing this? Well, here is electricity, here's magnetism. We will need this background in order to approach these subjects on Saturday out of spiritual science, which I will try to do. Now, how do we perceive these? So, our sense of touch helps us perceive the warmth ether, sight the light ether, taste the chemical ether, and interestingly, smell. And for those who don't know this, and I didn't know this until recently, in the early days, Steiner called this the atomistic ether, that he calls the life ether. And he used the word sometimes both in the, in the lecture. He'd say atomistic or life ether. So in the in, um, in the element of air, we have hearing. So what about water and earth? He says, those are in the future. We don't have those today. Those are future senses we will develop. And nowhere have I found in talking about any senses for the fallen ethers. I think that's something that won't happen until we get to what's called Jupiter, which is the planetary condition that follows Earth. Okay, as I say, these slides are all up on the website, so you're welcome to pull them down um, if you can't keep up on the notes, because I've got to move very quickly in order to get through what I want to tonight. So where are we going from here? Here we are at Earth. When we complete this period of evolution, where do we go? And so um, <clears throat> why do we have a uh, physical world? Well, we are performing a service by coming down to this physical world for the spiritual world. It's a kind of service that we're doing. But it's also because we can't experience certain things in the spiritual world. So we'll try to answer what are those sort of things. Um, but he says, in order to gather from the earth, these fruits of earth experience, we have to fully descend into the physical world. And then we're going to carry up the results of that to the spiritual world. So there's something to bring back. And I invite you to think of, um, in Christianity, the parable of the talents. And so... <clears throat> So in order to attain that, he says, we really must plunge down into this physical world. Our very spirit in this quest for knowledge must dive down into the physical world. And then for the sake of the spiritual world, we must immerse ourselves in this physical world. So let's take a look at this diagram again and ask, where do we go from here? And he says, there will be a kind of step up into Jupiter and on Jupiter, we will develop manas, or um, spirit self. This is a Vedic term. And in that <coughs> role here, we will have our existence in what today is called supernature. But there's also something else here that's very important to bear in mind as human beings 
we don't only ascend. And I'm going to close on Saturday with the last letter called uh, Supernature and Subnature, the last letter in the Michael Mysteries that Steiner wrote to the Anthroposophists after the Christmas Foundation meeting. And we have to go in both directions. If you can think of the human being in our